Hello everyone, welcome back. My name is Joe Cass. I'm a director here at S&P Global Ratings. I'm the creator and host of the Fixed Income of 15 podcast. And today I'm talking to Ashish Shah, CIO at Goldman Sachs Asset Management, and Ruth Yang, Global Head of Thought Leadership at S&P Global Ratings. So today we're talking private markets, we're talking inflation, and the art of communication. So a quick reminder, here's a disclaimer, that the views of the external guest are their views alone, and they do not represent the views of S&P Global Ratings. Okay, let's get into it. Ashish, first of all, congrats on your kind of fairly recent promotion to Chief Investment Officer at GSAM. Can you tell me, just at a high level, what you're doing at Goldman, your responsibilities, and maybe your high-level objectives too? Sure thing, Joe, and and thank you very much for that. Um, So I'll I'll start off. The responsibility set is really the people, process, and performance across our $2 trillion public markets platform. Um, Within that, we have a couple of initiatives that I'm very focused on. So the first is making sure that we bring sustainability across our entire investment platform, um, including the integration of our NNIP acquisition. Second, um, it's really delivering um, SMAs to our retail clients um, across our best-in-class SMA platform, which uh, exists across munis, fixed income, and, of course, direct indexing in equities. Finally, um, you know, the, the kind of fourth, third area that we are very focused on is, particularly at this time, given increases of short-term rates is making sure that we help our clients generate the best returns on their cash. And and that happens to be our liquidity platform, which is best in class. Great, great stuff. So Ruth, hello, welcome. Thank you. So can you talk us through your career thus far to date, um, your role as Global Head of Thought Leadership at S&P Global Ratings? Thank you for, well, first show, thank you for inviting me to join your podcast. So I've really spent the majority of my career in the Levin market, much of, much of which has been with LCD, where I have helped to expand its coverage from data to news from the U.S. to Europe. And I'm really proud to be part of its growth into, today, into today's market-leading information provider for the Levin market. Right now, I've assumed this role of Global Head of Thought Leadership. I joined late last year, and I'm part of the broader S&P Global Ratings Research, Sustainable Finance, and Innovation team. And I really wear two hats, supporting thought leadership as well as managing the team that focuses on credit research. With regard to being the global head of thought leadership, really my definition emphasizes the leadership aspect of the title. My job isn't to be the thought leader. I'm really not that smart. But thought, because thought leadership abounds here. My job is to cultivate and curate the existing thought leadership and give it a strong delivery platform as possible so that it reaches as large an audience as possible. For example, S&P Global Ratings theme for 2022 is a world redefined, and we've identified six thematic pillars that include the impact of digital disruption, geopolitical shocks, and the critical move to net zero. We've worked with several teams across S&P Global to support the publication of unique thought leadership articles, including a recent piece about the impact of food price shocks in the Middle East and North African economies. In addition, my team focuses on credit trends, ratings performance, default analysis, and credit conditions. And the impact of our work is very far-reaching, though, because credit insights are so fundamental to ratings and S&P. Our credit insights, our thought leadership on the credit markets, and credit generally really brings together the full expanse of S&P's global coverage across all divisions. Great. So, Ashish, can you give us your take on the past kind of year or so in the markets, taking into account everything, central bank intervention, the impact on fixed income, inflation, interest rates, and potentially where 2022 could take us. Sure, I'm going to start with central banks because I, I, I think that you know if we were to zoom out maybe past the past year um, to the last kind of two and a half years, um, you've really been in three phases. Um, you know, the, the past was about heavy accommodation given the pandemic and the liquidity shock that the pandemic presented, making sure that the global economy could go through that, um, that liquidity shock and that growth shock um, without doing an excessive amount of damage. Um, you know, more recently, we've been in the fast 
uh, phase of uh, pulling back on that accommodation as uh, the economy has kind of you know come back from COVID and if anything has accelerated and created challenges around inflation. And central banks found themselves being highly accommodative at a time when there was just not the need for that accommodation. So getting a lot closer to neutral is the phase that we're in right now. But very quickly, we're going to find ourselves in kind of the next phase, which is more typical. Um, and that that's where, you know, central banks are kind of closer, you know, at neutral um, into a hot economy, but a slowing economy. And they're going to have to navigate that, that process. Um, you know, how quickly do they, they raise into um, what is, you know, a high but falling inflation uh, relative to their targets? And how do they navigate the deceleration of growth? I think when you translate that into uh, markets, you know, we, we saw a very kind of a similar dynamic around the markets. You had the euphoria of that liquidity hitting markets. Um, it took rates to the lowest levels that we've seen in a little while. Um, you took equities to valuation levels that arguably were too high. Um, and you know, we all got to learn about meme stocks and NFTs and other ways that were um, a little bit on the creative side of how people were deploying their capital. And, and this year is, um, and really towards the end of last year, was kind of the unwinding of some of that excess liquidity in equity markets, even in some of the fixed income markets to what I would call as a, a, a more normal type of environment. And now we have to um, figure out, you know, how is growth going to impact earnings? How is inflation going to impact earnings um, as we go through this deceleration of growth? Uh, but all, all the time with an environment where, you know, rates aren't super high, um, but they are definitely trending higher um, and investors need to generate returns in the long term. And so it's a really interesting time to be an investor. Um, there, there's been a tremendous amount of volatility, just the, n not, not just within markets, but within the real economy um, and within real prices. And, uh, and I, I think that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for those that have the stomach to, to deal with the volatility. Fantastic. So Ruth, I did want to talk to you a bit about private debt, which seems to be all the rage at the moment, but it's quite hard to nail down a solid definition. And it kind of seems a bit different from to take on different forms in different markets. So what do you consider the most important types of private debt as we transition maybe into a potential bear market? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason it's all the rage dovetails off of Ashish's observations about how we're adapting, you know, this year to last year and the year before. The term private debt is extremely broad. Technically, it's any debt raised related to a privately held company. There's a lot that falls under there. I think that the private debt that's getting a lot of attention today is really private credit, privately negotiated debt that's primarily arranged and held by non-bank institutions. And this has traditionally kind of been the direct lending middle market side of broadly syndicated or large corporate loans. But what we're seeing is that the smaller side of broadly syndicated is increasingly being placed right now through the direct lending private credit market. And I think that it is really important as these credit markets face rising headwinds. Under current market conditions, the private debt markets provide the opportunity for borrowers and lenders to figure out what works in this changing world. Fundraising here is more of a discovery process, negotiating what deal terms, including pricing, and terms and conditions make sense in order to make a deal work. The credit markets need to find their way forward, right? As I mentioned, headwinds are rising, and there's no, no doubt that deal making needs to be more cautious. But there's really no reason for corporate financing for M&A, CapEx, anything like that to come to a screeching halt. The private credit direct lending makes sense in terms relative to what is going on in the broader economy. Borrowers have more confidence about execution and access to capital is faster than in broadly syndicated right now. And lenders generally come away with better terms and a closer relationship with the borrower. So I think it is important as we navigate this changing environment. And Ruth, in regards to the corporate world, the convergence between syndicated and private isn't exactly a new phenomenon. 
So in the past, direct lending deals moved into this syndicated market to get better terms or lower pricing. So now private markets are taking these big deals that could have been syndicated. So do you think this trend is going to continue? I do think it will continue. You know, that border between large corporate and middle market, as you mentioned, has always been porous, increasingly so over the past decade. When we say smaller large corporate is going to private credit markets, that definition of smaller is rapidly getting bigger. You know, we know that broadly syndicated continues to seek its footing in this new challenging economic environment. And direct lending has already funded $2 billion transactions. And we know that they've, they're looking at $5 billion or more in size. It's clear there's a lot of appetite for private credit, but please bear in mind that this is still largely within the existing ecosystem of credit investors. The lenders to private debt aren't new entrants to the space. By and large, they are existing and experienced credit market investors, many of whom have played in both the middle and large corporate markets for many years. They all know that they still have to do their credit homework. They understand how it works from origination through refinancing and restructuring, though. And that if they do their fundamental credit analysis, they have an opportunity to make good investments, potentially on better terms than broadly syndicated has seen in quite a while. Great. So, Ashish, what is Goldman Sachs Asset Management take on the size of the potential growth of private debt? How could it impact public markets? And if this debt is opaque, does private debt have the potential to be the next subprime crisis? Sure. So I, I think kind of building on Ruth's comments, you know, I, I do think you're supposed to think about this market as really, really a um, extension of um, the credit market. So you have to look at the the you know, bank loan market, the high yield bond market and private credit markets as one ecosystem. And I think issuers are going to issue um, based on uh, where they find kind of their needs being met across those three markets. In, in private markets, oftentimes you're making the trade-off between uh, either giving something um, to the lender, either through the form of structure or better terms or um, higher, higher yields, um, in exchange for getting greater flexibility and maybe kind of not having to go through the broadly syndicated process, which can oftentimes be um, uh, you know, slow and cumbersome. Uh, as a function of you know what market environment you're in, um, I I do think that um, you know we have to make sure that those private markets continue to de demonstrate the discipline that they have in in the past. Um, we we all find you know credit cycles have existed here you know in our lifetimes as people go through fear and greed. And I, I don't think we're going to eliminate fear and greed in markets, um, you know, as a function of uh, n new innovation. Those are all going to always going to exist. But at the same time, I think that uh, private markets do a really good job of kind of eliminating some of the conflicts that you end up uh, within public markets, whether it's distressed investors trying to, you know, play one part of the capital structure across each other, just the deadweight costs of bankruptcy um, that you can restructure in the private markets much more uh, effectively. Um, but to your point, there's going to be less transparency um, uh, around capital being deployed, and and so it's something that we'll all have to kind of keep a closer eye on. The next thing is that having public markets alongside of private markets will create some of that transparency because that'll always be an option for issuers as they seek capital. Sure. Ashish, we've seen some noise um, around the large asset manager's stance on the financing of fossil fuel companies. So in the current environment, how does Goldman Sachs Asset Management think about ESG and fixed income, and the opportunities in the green bond universe. Sure. So, um, you know, I'll start off with the fact that, like, sustainability and the focus on sustainability is one of the biggest opportunities in our lifetime. It's something that, you know, um, you know, I, I think we have to focus on. 
um, because the amount of capital that we're deploying and the need for that capital in order to you know, stabilize climate across the world, get us to net zero, is absolutely critical. You're talking about north of you know, $50 trillion of capital that's going to be required to get to net zero. And, and that amounts to something like $2.8 trillion a year of additional investment that's going to be required. Um, the, the, the second thing though, I would say is that, you know, people like to throw around the term ESG and yet, you know, it means something a little bit different to every manager. And in my mind, um, you know, ESG is very much about being an active investor. Um, these, these kind of categories of risk and opportunity or growth opportunity are absolutely critical to consider as an investor, um, we, we just happen to boil them down into three letters. Um, the first most important thing around those three, three letters, E, S, and G, is how material is something. Um, you'll have issues across that are environmental, that are social, and that involve governance. And a lot of times those three issues interact quite a bit, but materiality matters is, is the most critical thing to, to feature in an investment decision. And frankly, as an active investor, it's something that we consider the most when it comes to ESG. Um, you know, f finally, you know, green bonds has been kind of a large and growing uh, part of the market. I think that there's been um, a lot of focus on exclusion, uh, when it comes to ESG, but the reality is most of ESG and sustainability is very much about um, advocacy. It's about um, making sure we're deploying capital in a way that's going to be productive and, and broadly productive for society. And when you have productive capital being deployed, that means that you're going to get paid back as a bond investor. And so a lot of our time uh, when it comes to the green bond market is spent in really making sure that Green bonds are um, being issued by companies that actually have true green roots, that they're thinking about their own sustainability strategy, um, that they're sharing metrics um, and holding themselves accountable so that we as investors can hold them accountable um, as an issuer. And I, I think that we, we believe that that's going to lead to less downside risk, um, a better sharp ratio, if you will, um, return. On, on that capital, and that capital is going to finance the transition, um, which, you know, at this point in time, when you look at sky high energy prices, a lot of people have kind of said, hey, you know, ESG has been wrong. And I, I would actually argue that um, a focus on the climate transition that needs to take place is exactly why I think you need green bonds, because green bonds are there to finance that transition. Um, and avoid the type of environment that we're in today. Great, thanks Ashish. So Ruth, an area I wanted to get your opinion on is communication. So as the person responsible for, for thought leadership at S&P Global Ratings, what channels do you think are kind of the most effective in sharing ideas and analysis on where we're at, essentially a B2B level? Yeah, so for me, a, a successful communication communication plan really involves both new and old school channels, right? We are we are trying to connect on a B2B level, but there's a, a really personal aspect of that too, I think, in thought leadership. There has to be an investment in the validity of the quality of thought leadership. So of course, social media is critical. You must have a strong social media strategy. And we're very lucky to have a really talented person in that role because it's probably not my forte. LinkedIn specifically is fundamental to our market outreach because it's a really great way to share our thought leadership while also bringing readers back to our website. But I will also argue for the old school in-person communications. As the world is reopened, we have really made an effort to connect in person through meetings, conferences. Conversations matter. Our individual relationships matter. And those long-term relationships really are important to entrenching our position as thought leaders. Sure. So Ashish, I wanted to get your view on the role of social media in markets generally. So I took a look at your LinkedIn profile. You've got nearly 5,000 followers. It's pretty impressive. So what do you think the role of social media is and how do you like to use it? 
Sure. So I, I think there are a number of different roles that social media can play. I think first and foremost, um, you know, educating investors is absolutely critical. Um, you want investors and, you know, i.e. your potential and, and actual clients to be well informed so that they can make the right decisions for them. And, and so we spend a lot of time making sure that um, our thought leadership is shared so that we can help in, uh, inform um, our clients and, and prospects. Um, you know, the, the second thing I would say is that, you know, we as an organization think it's really important to um, make sure that both our own people as well as prospective uh, employees have an opportunity to get to know us um, and, and to really hear from the leadership um, of the organization. And so we spend a lot of time um, kind of posting and, and sharing what we're doing internally, both for our internal audiences, as well as for, um, you know, folks that might be thinking about working at, at Goldman Sachs. Sure, sure. So Ruth, which individuals in financial markets broadly, do you make a point to stop and listen to or read on a regular basis? So I think two anchors for me are one is The Economist. It's definitely required reading, right? I can't get through all of it every week, but I know that if I don't at least try, I really miss out on important insights into what the broader world and the markets are worried about. As an individual, Ian Bremer at Eurasia Group is really a must read. We receive his weekly updates and they're extremely helpful in understanding the complexities of risk and political risk and economic risk and how they come together. I do think it's also important to stand to look out for new perspectives on the world. Um, the most interesting book that I've read in the last few months is James Falk's Financial Cold War, which looks at the relationship between the U.S. and China based upon their individual roles in and history with the global financial market. So I think you, you got to stick to the things you know, but always be on the lookout for new opportunities and perspectives. Sure. So Ashish, can you talk to us a little bit about growing up and your childhood? So did you did you ever think you'd be the chief investment officer at Goldman Sachs Asset Management one day? And did you have kind of other aspirations or were sort of finance and analysis always your, your strengths? Yeah, so so I, I, I never thought um, I would be in the seat. And I'll, I'll be 100% honest that there are days I walk in. Um, it's pretty much every day I walk in, I look around, I, I say, I can't believe I'm here. Um, I re really am humbled to be here. Um, I, I grew up uh, in a part of Pennsylvania where people didn't know that this job existed or that you know, Wall Street was this faraway place. Um, you know, I, I, I think growing up, I assumed that I was going to be a scientist or an engineer. Um, and I, I benefited from the fact that my father, who was an engineer, um, was actually very fascinated by markets. And so, you know, a lot of the books and um, reading material in the house um, was really all financially geared. He was an early investor with uh, Fidelity. And so he would take the time to, to teach me. And um, it, was as, it was as a function of, you know, hearing and watching him do what he was doing that I got interested in finance, ended up at um, the Wharton School, uh, you know, in uh, also uh, one of the two colleges I applied to, both were uh, Pennsylvania-based colleges. And, and I had the fortune, good fortune to end up working for a professor by the name of uh, uh, Jeremy Siegel, who I think uh, after I worked for him became quite famous and well-known, um, having uh, written stocks for the long run uh, back in in the early 90s. And, and if you actually take a look at the first edition of that book, you'll see my name referenced there as his uh, uh, research assistant. <laughs> That's cool. And so kind of a high level question for you both here. Which book changed your life? So that can be anything from fiction, nonfiction, anything from kind of work, outside work, and also how did it change your life? So Ruth, I'll start with you. Okay, so I will admit there's no doubt that the most influential book in my life, and it's one that I refer to both young women, older women, anybody who meets me is a book called Rage Becomes Her by Soraya Chamali. And from this book, I, you know, in, in my growing awareness of feminism became, really became to understand that 
Anger, women's anger is a natural part of our emotional spectrum and it's fundamental and actually necessary to our success. It's an issue that I think a lot of women struggle with, how to be comfortable with our anger and this book is really illuminating. And to kind of highlight one of my favorite quotes really is that she says, women especially will be told to set our anger aside in favor of a kinder, gentler approach to change. This is a false juxtaposition. Re-envision anger can be the most feminine of virtues compassionate, fierce, wise, and powerful. And that phrase, like I carry around with me as an important part of how I get through a lot of things, both challenging and natural to me as, you know, as I navigate this world. Great. Fantastic. And Ashish? Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't say that um, th there hasn't been a book that I, I would say has uh, impacted me uh, and, and certainly reached the changing my life. Um, ha having said that, one of my favorite books and, and most impactful books was uh, Innovator's Dilemma, which was a required reading by Jim Crow when I joined Level 3 Communications back in 1999. And it, it really kind of highlighted for me, how does innovation um, work in a large company? How do these really kind of franchise-oriented companies lose their way um, and 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 kind of miss out on opportunities that they should uh, be able to capture. Um, and, and it spoke to kind of the rise and fall of large, powerful companies. If you want to know the, the one thing that actually did change my life in a material way, there's a program that Hopkins runs called uh, CTY. And CTY is, you know, uh, you know I think could be called uh, or considered nerd camp. And it, it was when I, where I found my tribe um, of, of fellow nerds and, and really kind of found comfort in my own skin. And it's something that I think uh, a number of kids uh, across the country end up participating in, both online and in person. And it's just a fantastic program. Fantastic. I mean, yeah, two, two really good answers. So Ashish, last question goes to you. So on Fixed Income in 15, I usually interview leaders, influential individuals from the world of finance and beyond. Who would you recommend I asked to be a guest on a future episode of the show? Sure. So uh, I, I would recommend Erica James, who's the dean of the Wharton School. And uh, the reason I would uh, interview her is, um, you know, she's going to be crafting the future of investors across um, markets. And so if you want to learn kind of how those investors are going to be developed, um, the foundational skills that they're going to be learning, um, you want to talk to uh, Dean James. And, and she's just an outstanding leader. Uh, her focus has been in crisis management. And I can tell you over the last two and a half years, um, your know, crisis management is uh, very much a investor skill. <laughs> okay, great. That's fantastic. So, that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much, Ashish and Ruth. And thank you for everyone watching, listening, wherever you are. See you next time on Fixed Income in 15.